Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Facebook Live with the Houston Zoo. We are down here at the NASA Johnson Space Center today to take a look at our Outwater Prairie Chicken program here. So you might be wondering, why are we here at the NASA Johnson Space Center? Well, we are in partnership with them because they have given us a plot of land here to raise our prairie chickens. And we are very lucky to have this land because it really mimics their natural habitat um, that we will be releasing them into. So it's better for them to develop these natural instincts while they're young. We're gonna take an inside look at the behind the scenes today. And so we're gonna go right in this way and I'll show you a few things. So we're now entering our keeper area. So this is where all the magic happens. This is where we do all our day-to-day -day tasks, including diet prep, um, maintenance, and we do a lot of storage here as well. Now, when I say prairie chickens, you might be wondering, is this like a regular chicken? And the answer to that is no. So our Atwater prairie chickens are actually grouse, um, whereas domestic chickens are a species of jungle fowl that descended from Asia. While they're both under the pheasant family, and they are not actually the same thing. So I think it's really important to make that distinction. So before we get to our prairie chickens, I want to show you a little bit about them. Um, we're going to start with our diet prep. So this is where we do all of our diet prep in here um, at NASA. And so this big table is our space. And we have right now about 100 birds just under. And so you can imagine how many, how many diets we have to put together in order to feed all of these birds each and every day. So you might be wondering, what are we feeding our birds? Well, they get a wide selection of products. Um, this includes some starters. So all of our chicks have this starter that is specifically put together to meet the nutritional needs of these birds. And so I'll sprinkle that on. Usually what we're going to do each day is we're going to soak these pellets. Um, because it has been so hot here in Houston, this is really great because the chicks like it because it gives it a little bit more of a softer um, palate when they put it in their mouth. But it also gives them some hydration. So we're hydrating them a little bit as well when we're feeding them. With these pellets, we also give them some greens. So in this jar, I have a blend of greens. That's from kale greens, some mustard greens, to lettuce greens. Um, and we give them a wide variety so that they can um, get an eclectic taste of them. So when they are released, they kind of know what they can eat in the wild. So we'll spread that out. So you might notice that this, these greens are relatively small. Um, that's because I'm preparing this for a chick. Chicks can't handle large quantities of greens that are really fibrous um, and large because they can ca cause impaction issues. So what we do is we blend it up so that they can still enjoy these greens without any health risks. Now our adults are actually going to get larger leafy greens. So sometimes we give them full greens or full leaves um, that they can just kind of peck at and they'll eat. And as the chicks get older, they'll also be able to handle larger amounts. Now the last thing we put on our diets is some bugs. So today I have some nice crickets for them. Um, these are relatively small crickets because like I said, these are going to some of our younger chicks. Um, so we just sprinkle some around on the plate and they'll be very excited to have these. We got a question. Um, are they, they related to extinct heath hen? They actually are very related to the heath hen. So the Atwater Prairie Chicken is a subspecies of the greater prairie chicken. And the heath hen was a similar bird that was found on the east coast. And unfortunately, they went extinct um, in the 1900s. And it was a really sad story, but also a really good story of hope for our prairie chickens because it drew a lot of attention to the birds down here. And so when the heath hens um, were noticed that their populations were declining, a 70-acre um, reserve was built so that they could repopulate and kind of have a space that's um, safe for them to build. And over the course of nine years, they rebounded to over 2,000 birds. Now, unfortunately, um, a forest fire actually wiped out their population shortly after this, and so they ended up going extinct. But because of this extinction event, a lot of people down here in Houston started to notice, hey, these birds are in a very similar situation. They're losing a lot of their natural habitat. And so we were able to draw a lot of attention to it and actually get them into a program as well. So. Uh, before we move on to the chicks, I kind of want to show you what we have. So we are lucky enough to still have one of our Atwater Prairie Chicken eggs from this year. So this is one of the eggs that did not develop. Um, so you may notice it looks very similar to maybe an egg you find in a store, just a little bit more of an oval shape. Um, we also have a label on it. So when we have our chicks lay eggs, or hens lay eggs, we'll actually label all of the eggs on them so that we can kind of tell which hen they came from and which number egg they were for the season. So this season we had about 170 eggs. 
um, which is really great for 11 of our hens that we're laying. So we had 12 pairs, one decided not to lay this year, um, which isn't uncommon, uh, but the other 11 did. And so this is one of the hens that was laying. She actually had two clutches. And so during the season, what we'll do is we'll actually let the hen sit on the eggs for about 10 to 15 days. And what happens then is we'll pull all of those eggs and put dummy eggs in. And then what we'll do is we'll take those eggs that are actually um, from the head and we'll go and candle them. And what that means is we shine a light into the egg to see if those eggs are actually developing. And if they are developing, we'll count out a certain amount. So usually for our hens here, for parent reared birds, which means the hen that laid them, we'll give them back about eight eggs so that they can raise those eight hips to hatch out. And we'll actually pull the rest and we'll either hand raise them or foster raise them. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but I think it's really important to know that our hens can lay about 20 eggs a season. Um, our median for the season was about 13 eggs per hen. So you can imagine that's a lot of eggs to take care of and a lot of chicks to potentially hatch out each and every year. So I'm gonna go now over to one of our pens so we can see these chicks in action. So we're gonna visit our parent reared birds first. So our parent reared birds are with one of our hens, actually who is a foster raised bird last year. Um, so she was one of our birds that we hatched out last year. Um, and she was raised by one of our domestic chickens and now she is fostering, or not fostering, she's raising her own chicks of the same scent. So these four birds here are about 50 days of age. So just about two months. Um, and as you can see, they really do enjoy the bugs. So the bugs are really what they're going to um, go for first. And then they'll of course go for the pellets and greens. Um, they are a little shy sometimes. So grouse are generally a very shy bird. And so what we see when we have grouse um, for breeding programs is that they need a lot of space. And so that's why we're really lucky to be down here at NASA is because we actually have space for these birds to move around and engage in their natural habitat. Uh, so yeah, we are down here at the NASA Johnson Space Center if you were just tuning in, which is really great. Um, they joined us in 2005 in partnership. And so they've given us this wonderful space to use for our birds. A little bit about the breeding program um, and the natural life cycle of our hens. So our outwater prairie chickens are actually very seasonal breeders. So usually their breeding season will last from probably late February up through May. And after that, they're not going to be in breeding season at all. So as you can imagine, in the wild, or in the wild you're going to see these birds um, have that. So if we have natural disasters or something that comes in and you know inhibits them from doing their natural breeding cycle, that can really hurt the population because over the course of the year, they're not going to actually lay any more eggs or raise any more chicks, which is one of the reasons here in Texas it can be really dangerous because we have so many hurricanes that come through and can really impact the, the numbers of these birds. So a typical breeding season in February to March, the males are going to start booming. So there is no male in this enclosure yet. Um, these chicks, one of them may be a male, but they don't have the plumage of the male. Typically, the males are um, going to have a yellow plumage on their neck and above their eyebrows, and it's very distinct. And what they'll do is they will go into what is called a lek. So it's a large field area, um, and usually they congregate um, by the hundreds. So when the population was large, up to 200 birds would join one swap and they do a little uh, mating display. So they'll do, do a stomping dance and try to attack the, f or try to attract the female. Now the female will stay on the outskirts of this lek and they will select their male. And once they select, they'll go off and they'll copulate and they'll actually go back and they'll lay their eggs. And then the female will take care of the entire clutch themselves. So the parent raising completely turns over to the female. So you might be wondering why we don't have any males in this enclosure with our hen. And that's because they don't typically have a part in the natural upbringing of the chicks um, out on the prairie. And so we're trying to mimic that here. So the male will go off and do his thing. The female will actually sit on the eggs for about 26 days. She'll lay about one egg a day, up to 20 eggs, like I said before, um, sometimes sooner. And then she'll sit and she'll start incubating for 26 days. And then after 26 days, the chicks will start hatching out. Here at the Houston Zoo, we're very excited that we have um, currently 74 chicks with us. Um, and they are all doing extremely well. And we're really excited because we're coming up on our release program as well. So. I'm gonna now move you over to our foster rear chicks. Now here at the Houston Zoo, we are really excited because we got to start doing a new technique for raising our chicks. And that's actually taking some of our outwater prairie chicken eggs and putting them under domestic chickens. 
and the chickens will actually hatch them out and raise them as their own. So I'm gonna take you in here. You may see way in the back there is Hedwig. Hedwig's a little bit of a nervous bird, but if she comes closer, um, you'll see that she is a really great mom and she's probably with her chicks right now protecting them. So what we'll do is after those 10 to 15 days or 10 to 13 days, we will pull the eggs from the APCs, um, which stands for Outwater Prairie Chicken, and we will decide which ones we want to give to our domestic chickens. Now our domestic chickens, we have a flock of 16 hens here that we just got in September. Uh, and we're very excited because a lot of them started sitting um, this year. And so once we notice that one of our domestic birds is sitting, what we do is we wait a few days and then we move them over to another enclosure where they can um, sit on some dummy eggs. When we have the Outwater Prairie Chicken eggs ready to go, we'll actually trade those dummy eggs out for the Outwater Prairie Chicken eggs, and they'll actually sit on them until they hatch and raise them as their own. So this year we had about 26 um, foster reared birds, which was really exciting. Um, we're really looking to increase this number, so we had a lot more that we could have foster reared. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of our hens weren't sitting yet because they are so young. So next year, we're really hoping to increase this number and make it a really sustainable program. Now, something that's really interesting that we've seen in the data from last year is that a lot of our foster reared birds actually have a better survivability in the wild, um, which was something that was really surprising. So. This year, we're hoping to kind of see if those numbers match up with last year's so that we can start to understand maybe why that's the case. You may also notice in this enclosure, we have a lot of natural prairie flowers. So we were very lucky to have volunteers here at the NASA Johnson Space Center from the Armand Bayou, who are our master naturalists. They come down and they volunteer their time to help match up our plants in these enclosures to really match what these birds are gonna see when they're released into the wild um, at Eagle Lake and Goliad um, come August or September. Now, you might be wondering why flowers? Well, it might surprise you, but part of the natural diet of birds is actually eating the petals of these flowers. And so we thought if we could give them that enrichment and kind of introduce them to these flowers early on, they would kind of recognize them when they got there and might have a better chance of survival because they're gonna recognize food right away. Now we work here at um, NASA to kind of make sure that our pens look really nice and neat. So you may notice that these are pretty trimmed pens. And so on the prairie, you're going to see a lot of open field as well as some um, bushes or like places of tall vegetation. So we're really trying to mimic that. You may also notice in these pens, there are some perching. So something that we've really noticed in the past year is that these birds are doing a lot of perching on what we call our A-frames, um, which we use to kind of shelter the food from the rain and getting washed out. And it wasn't something we were expecting because it wasn't something part of the natural behaviors that we had noticed before at the, um, the refuge. And so we wanted to see maybe if perching was part of the natural behaviors that we haven't seen. So this year what we're doing is we're including perching in two of our enclosures with some domestic chickens, um, chicks, and the parent reared and seeing you know, how they utilize that to see if we can better um, increase the welfare and space of birds in the future years. Miranda asks, if you want, if you work at NASA, is there an opportunity to see the APCs in person? I would say there's definitely an opportunity to see the outwaters in person. Um, I know there are tours that are set up each and every year so people to come in and um, get a look at them. I would say um, definitely work with um, your team to see if that's something you can do. You can also reach out to us um, at the Houston Zoo. And I think that's something we'd be happy to, you know, give you a little tour of all of our birds. They're always very happy to see our visitors and we're always really happy to get a chance to talk to people about um, the Outwater Prairie Chickens. Uh, something that we don't realize here is that these Outwater Prairie Chickens are actually local for here in Texas. Um, and that's something crazy because when we think of endangered species, which these birds are, it's not something we think about being in our own backyard. And these birds are actually really right in our own backyard. And so the Texas coastal prairie is actually one of the most endangered biomes in the world with only 1% of its um, original you know, land mass left. And so there's so much we can do to help these birds and other birds that were part of that habitat uh, and so we really need to start thinking, you know, what can we do to help recover not only this species, but other species that were part of that biome. Perfect. 
So Liz asks, why was Johnson Space Center chosen for these birds? So we were really lucky to have a relationship with NASA Johnson Space Center. Part of the reason we chose this space um, and they offered it up is because, as I was saying earlier, grouse are a really nervous bird. So you might notice them kind of tucking into the corner um, and that's a natural behavior. They're very nervous. And so when we raise these grouse, we need a lot of space. So as you can imagine at the Houston Zoo, there's not a ton of space for these birds to kind of you know, walk around and have um, a natural range to hide under bushes and grow stuff. And so we really thought this was a really great opportunity for us to put them on natural prairie grasses that they're gonna see when they're released. And hopefully, through this process, we're going to create better birds that are qu more quality with survival instincts for when we release them. And so our hope was giving them the space would not only decrease injuries from you know their frightfulness of um, people and loud sounds, because you can imagine at the zoo with helicopters and guests, um, there are a lot of those. Down here, it's a lot quieter, and so they're not as likely to you know be frightened by those loud, loud sounds. Um, it also gives an opportunity to get to know the foliage that they're going to be released onto and so that will hopefully increase their chance of survivability when we release them into the wild. All right, we are now going to head over to some of our other birds. Um, the next birds we're going to see are some of our younger birds. Uh, these are the youngest birds. They're about two weeks old, just under. They just hatched in the middle of June. So we'll see if we can get them on camera. They are very small and um, sometimes very hard to see. So hopefully they'll run up. Over the past few weeks, they've been a little bit shy, but they've been getting more and more bold as they know the bugs are coming. And so we're hoping to feed them a little bit and see if we can get them on camera. All right. So we actually have one right up front here. Let's see if I can get the other ones up here as well. So as you're gonna notice, the hen, the mom is gonna run up. She's very protective of her chicks. She's been a really good mom this year. Um, give her some bugs as well. <laughs> so she's gonna protect her chicks um, because she sees those as threats and all of her chicks, while they're young, they're doing really well. So like I said, these hatched out about two weeks ago. Um, and we're really excited they're doing this well. This hen has laid two clutches, so we actually pulled the first clutch. Um, and so when we're talking about those sitting behaviors from their egg clutches, sometimes they won't sit and they'll actually start laying a second clutch. And so if we notice that the hen hasn't been sitting for a few days after they've stopped laying, we'll actually pull that clutch so that we can uh, put them in our artificial incubation. Um, and I'll talk about that with hand rearing. Um, or we'll give them to a domestic chicken. And so she said, I would like to lay <laughs> more than 20 eggs this season. And that's what she did. And then she has been really great with her second clutch. All right, Jessica, Jessica asks, at what age are they released into the wild? So that's a really good question. So our hope is we usually will start releasing the birds um, three or four months after they have been born. So August and September are typically the period in which we will release, uh, but we can release them as early as July sometimes, depending on you know when they were um, born. And that's because they're gonna be fully grown within that time period. And so they're ready to be released. Now, when we release the birds, what we do, um, you know, the hen is usually really um, close with the chicks and we'll stay with them. So if we can, we'll actually release the hen with her chicks um, so that they're all in the same group when they get released. So they have the familiarity of the chicks that they were with as well as the hen that raised them. Additionally, when we're looking to see what birds we want to release, we're also looking to see what birds um, are genetically significant and we want to keep behind um, because they're going to be good for future populations to kind of increase those genetics or keep the genetics diverse enough. Um, but also which ones will be good moms. So we're actually seeing if birds that were parent raised each year, if we keep one of them for the next year, if they'll be really good moms as well and raise chicks just as well as those. Sometimes we'll also keep hens that have done a really fantastic job raising their own chicks. And so we can kind of tell when moms are good and bad. Some will do really good and actually, as this one is doing, not eat all the bugs that we're throwing to the chicks. Other moms are not as generous and will go right for the chicks and does direct competition, which can be challenging. Um,
but they'll do a good job brooding. Um, and so we'll typically see with this hen in the morning when we come in, all of the chicks will be under her wings and she'll be brooding them for warmth. And it's really cute. You can see all of their little feet sticking out from under her wings. Um, and sometimes they'll even poke their head out, um, which you know someday I hope to get a picture of because it is one of the most adorable things you'll see. So it looks like they're done with us. So we're gonna move next door. And these are some of our hand raised birds. So all of these birds were actually um, hand raised. And so what that means for us is that we have pulled the eggs from you know day 15 or so after we put the eight back under the hen and we brought them back to the zoo for artificial incubation. And so we have incubators at the zoo that will actually keep the eggs at the temperature and rotate them um, just like a hen would. And then when they reach the hatching period, what we'll do is we'll put them in our hatchers, which are contraptions that allow the chick to hatch out safely. And we'll move them over to a little brooder boxes. And these are little boxes that have very warm um, settings. So you'll notice that when chicks first hatch out, they spend a lot of time under their mom. And that's because they really need to stay at that high temperature, almost um, 96 degrees. Um, and so these brooder boxes mimic that and that allows us also to get weights and feed them and kind of keep a close eye on them Let's see if we can get them to come up so these guys are a little bit nervous as well so you might notice they're a little shy um, but there's not a lot they won't do for bugs so what's really great about hand raising is that you know we get a constant eye on them um, with our parent reared and foster reared birds we really let the the moms do a lot of the raising but with hand rearing we can weigh them each day make sure they're gaining and keep a close eye on them um, but we are moving away from our hand raising uh, and this is because we really want to we really think that raising them with foster chickens and their actual hens give them better survival instincts when we release them into the wild and so if we can give them that natural uh, ability to raise their own chicks that's something that we want to do it also allows us to you know potentially raise more chicks because as you can imagine hand raising all these chicks is a lot of work and a lot of um, personnel needed for that and so when we have more chicks under these hens and the hens are taking care of them um, while we don't see them as frequently we're actually able to raise more because they are actually able to um, be taken care of by their actual mom perfect well thank you so much today for joining us at the johnson space center our nasa johnson space center we are really thankful for you to be able to take a look at our atwater prairie chicken program um, if there's any more questions feel free to leave them in the comments we're happy to answer them we'll get back to you with those answers uh, all of our chicks are doing really well. We're really excited for a release in August and we hope to kind of keep you updated on our story as we move forward. Um, this year we're hoping to release them all relatively soon. We're actually meeting later today to talk about those release efforts and so we'll have an update for you on our Houston Zoo website pretty soon. So thank you all for taking the time to talk to us and we'll see you next time.